You got that on? Hey, praise God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer as we prepare to seek him in his word this morning. Father God, we just thank you for your love and we thank you for your glory in our lives and we just thank you for your presence in this room today. We give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are and for who you're making us to be. We ask you, Lord, as we enter into your word this morning, that you would give us everything that is contained in this portion of Scripture to fill us up, to lift us up, to change us from within. We just give you glory, honor, and praise for each of these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been going through a series here at Praise Tabernacle as we are working through the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, and we've been doing them in the order that Paul wrote them along the way. So we're following his journey as we did in the book of Acts. And as we do, we're addressing the things that Paul addressed, the issues, the issues that came up with these churches. So this morning, we're going to talk about immaturity, the issue of immaturity. And so before we get into the word, I want to share with you my three favorite quotes about immaturity. Quote number one, if I had a dollar for every time somebody called me immature, I'd buy so many Hot Wheels. Quote number two, my wife told me I was immature and needed to grow up. Guess who's not allowed in my treehouse anymore? Quote number three, my girlfriend left me because she thinks I'm immature. Now it's Christmas Day and I'm crying my eyes out because I just found out that Santa isn't real. <laughs> so God's plan for his children is that we would grow up, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. And here in chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he addresses this problem that is plaguing this young Corinthian church. They're young. They were just started recently. So they are spiritually immature. Now, there's an old saying that says this, you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. And that's the problem. The Christians in Corinth had a lot of growing up to do. And so Paul opens the third chapter of his letter with these words. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I give you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. Look, the reality is this. Physically and spiritually, we all start off as babies. We start off as babies in the natural, and when we get born again, we start off as spiritual babies. And growth takes time. And when Paul first planted this church in Corinth, it was only natural that these brand new believers would be spiritually immature. They were brand new babies in Christ. They needed to learn the foundations of the faith. But as we mature in our faith, we ought to grow up little by little. We ought to develop a more Christ-like spirit and attitude. We ought to understand more and more of the Bible. Paul put it this way in chapter 13 of this letter, which we'll get to down the road. But he says this, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And it had been a few years since Paul had first started this church in Corinth, and yet they were still struggling with this immaturity. And so now he addresses, again, one of the things that is keeping them from growing into maturity. Starting in verse 3, he says, For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul. Another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? Who then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. 
So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. So Paul had started this church in Corinth uh, during one of his missionary journeys. And we saw that in Acts chapter 18. He landed in Corinth and established this church. But shortly after that, got a church established, got some leaders. Hopefully they're growing. And he moves on. Paul was going from city to city, establishing churches in as many places as possible. So after he moves on, there comes another young leader into Corinth. And his name is Apollos. And Apollos had this real natural gift of teaching. And so he made an immediate impact in Corinth. And he spoke boldly. And he was very able. Remember, the Corinthians were not Jewish. They were uh, pagans who had gotten saved. But, But here comes Apollos, and he's able to speak and interpret all the Old Testament scriptures effectively. And these opponents of Christianity, these people who had chased Paul out of Corinth and other cities. They were Jewish people trying to tell the people that Christianity was wrong. And Apollos was able to debate against them. He was able to use those Old Testament scriptures forcefully and convincingly. And he was committed to continue this work that Paul had started. So Paul is quick to point out to the Corinthians, it was God, not him, not Apollos, that was bringing growth to that church. Paul had planted the church, yes, But Apollos had come in and watered the church, yes. But God had harvested what they had done. So now Paul's talking about what it looks like to be mature means serving others. He says this starting in verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another, meaning Apollos, is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If a man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So Paul is comparing the church, and he's really comparing each of our individual lives as believers to a building that's under construction. Now, the foundation of the church and the foundation for us as believers is Christ. That's why Jesus said the wise man builds his house on the rock, not on the sand. We've got to be on that solid rock of Christ. And nothing and no one else will do. You can't have a a, a walk of faith without being built on Christ. But the building is only as solid as that foundation. And if anyone doesn't make uh, faith in Christ the bedrock of their beliefs, whatever they're doing is destined to collapse. So we have this foundation, which is Christ. Nothing can change that. Nothing can shake that. But that doesn't ensure that the building that's being built on it will last. Because Paul compares our work, our ministry, our service to God to construction materials. And literally, I think this is where the story of the three little pigs came from. Because he's talking about building with hay and straw and all that stuff. It's not going to last. He says, if you want to last, you're going to have to build with things like gold and silver and precious stones. Because in the end, what we do with the foundation we've been given will be tested. The foundation of our lives will be tested. And Jesus laid this foundation for us. If he's the foundation, then we should be trying to do what he did. What did Jesus do? He served. And so we carry on that ministry. When we carry on the ministry of Christ, we're building with precious things. But when we're doing stuff that's our own thing, like this is what I want to do, we're really just building with straw. 
things that are not going to last. Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, as one commentary put it, the problem here in Corinth was the Corinthian Christians were more interested in serve us than service. And so, immature Christians, what do they do? They say, well, I'm looking for a church that meets my needs and takes care of me. That's okay. That's what new believers need. Somebody help me. Somebody teach me. Somebody take care of me. That's okay. But mature believers say, I'm looking for a place where I can serve, where I can be a blessing to others. As, as we mature in Christ, the focus of our lives should shift increasingly from live, to living a, service of life, a life of service to others. Because a, a, mature, a mature follower stops asking, who's going to meet my needs, and starts asking this, whose needs can I meet? And that's what Paul was looking for from the Corinthian church. He was trying to call them to a higher level of maturity. And he says this, Do you not know that you're a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that's what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men. For all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So the question I want to ask you is this. Does any of this have any application to our lives today? I think it does. Now let me, let me go with you to 2 Timothy 3.1. Paul says to Timothy, but realize this. That in the last days, difficult times will come. Are there difficult times in our world today? I think so. It's getting to be a crazy place out there. And they may be getting worse. They may be getting more difficult. And it's going to really require us to be mature in order to handle these difficult challenges. There will be a test of our maturity as followers of Jesus Christ. And an area uh, uh, where we can show more maturity and grace, I believe, than the Corinthian church did. We can be more mature than them. But before I address the specifics, I want to add this one additional scripture. This is from Ephesians 4. Paul says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were all called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul uses a word here. We don't use that commonly in our language. He uses this word, I implore. I implore you to work towards unity and peace. He's begging them to be patient, to be humble, to be gentle, to be tolerant, to be loving towards one another. He says, we all have the same Lord. We all have the same Father in heaven. We're all filled with the same Holy Spirit. We're all chasing after the same hope. We've all been baptized in the name of the same Savior. So let me ask you something. Can I implore you this morning in that same way? You might say, well, Pastor Steve, what are you talking about? 
We don't have the issues that they had. There's no Apollos and Paul stuff. There's no jealousy and strife among us. We're not fleshly. We're not walking as mere men. We're not immature. I'm not saying that we are. But I think we need to be warned that there are difficult times ahead, in particular, as we enter into this coming election cycle. And Pastor Josh addressed this. I listened to his message, even though I was out in Hawaii. I listened to his message. And he addressed this. I want to address it again because Paul is bringing it up again here like he did in the first chapter. He's bringing it up again in the third chapter because it's so important. I, I think we're all familiar with Psalm 133, verse 1. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers, brothers to dwell together in unity. And let me say this. If it's fair to say that dwelling in unity is good and pleasant, then dwelling in disunity is bad and unpleasant. But we don't have to allow disunity to enter into our body. So let me give you this example uh, to shed some light, because Paul has talked about this in the first chapter, and he brings it back again in the third chapter. So let's just say this. Let's say that Paul and Apollos are candidates for office. So why would people want to vote for Paul? Well, his campaign literature would say this. He, he was a strong voice for the gospel. He was bold. He wrote powerful letters. He planted churches. He was willing to risk his life and suffer hardship in order to reach the world for Jesus. Well, why wouldn't you want to vote for Paul? Well, I'll tell you why you might not want to vote for Paul. He participated in the murder of Stephen. He had persecuted and arrested many believers. He got into a very public argument with Barnabas over whether or not to take John Mark along on their missionary journey. Just blew up in public. Not too good. What about Apollos? Why would people want to vote for Apollos? Well, he was well learned. He was a great public speaker. He could argue convincingly against these unbelievers, these Jewish people who are trying to sway people away from Christ. So why wouldn't somebody want to vote for Apollos? Well, because Apollos didn't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. And so Priscilla and Aquila would have to pull him aside and correct him. And then Paul had to come back in and correct the misunderstanding about baptism that Apollos had brought because of his lack of knowledge. And while we're at it, let's throw in a third-party candidate, Kephas. Let's vote for Kephas. Who's Kephas? Kephas is Peter. Okay, Kephas is, is the name means the, the stone or the rock. That's what Jesus called him. And we saw that in chapter 1, uh, Paul said that there was people who said they were followers of Paul, followers of Apollos, and some said they were apostles or followers of Kephas. So why would anyone vote for Peter? Well, he was bold. He was the first person to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. He wrote two books in the New Testament. And he fought to defend Jesus by cutting off the high priest's servant's ear. I think that's pretty good. Why would anyone not want to vote for Peter? Well, there was this little thing about denying three times that he even knew Jesus. He had a little problem with impulsivity. And there's a strange reality that even though he was married, we never hear about his wife. Little strange things going on there. Look, my point is simply this. None of these three men, as powerful figures as they are in New Testament, would have been a perfect candidate because there are no perfect candidates. As Paul puts it, they are all just mere men. And so are we, just mere men and women. And we're trying our best as believers to decide which candidates for various public offices are most deserving of our support despite the fact that they all have flaws. Now, some believers have a hierarchy of things that they say, well, it's important to me how a candidate stands on this or this issue. So some of those issues might be abortion. That's really high on my list personally. I'll just tell you that. I always look at where the candidate stands on abortion because I'm very pro-life and I feel like that's where I want to put my vote towards. People say, Traditional family values are important. I want to find candidates that stand up for family values. Those are very solid Christian things for us to consider as we enter into the voting booth. 
Some believers say, but the most important thing to me is defending the poor and caring for the poor, because didn't Jesus tell us to do that? Shouldn't we be standing up, finding candidates to stand up for human rights, for civil rights? Shouldn't those be the people that we go in the battle box and say, yes, that person should represent me? Because those are clearly important biblical values as well. And some of this really just comes down to our viewpoint in terms of our our individual background or the culture we were raised in. I want to share with you something that somebody shared with me. It's a beautiful thing. It says, cultural sensitivity allows us to respect and value other cultures with no hidden agendas. It is acknowledging that differences exist between us, but not assigning values to those differences by saying that one is better than the other where one is inherently right and the other is wrong. It is building an environment that encourages discussion and strengthens teamwork through education and acceptance of other viewpoints. And I think those are really encouraging words. Because in the end, there is a way for us to handle this challenge. And it's shown in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, Paul is discussing differences of opinions among believers. He's talking about people who have different uh, feelings regarding what kind of foods are acceptable to eat or what kind of holidays they should celebrate. And in verses 12 and 13, he simply says this, So that that each one of us shall give an account to himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? If, if, if you're going to vote for a certain candidate, then vote for that candidate because it's, you're convicted in your heart to do that. But let, let other people who are your brothers and sisters in Christ have their opinion of how they want to vote because of the reasons that they have chosen in their heart because they have to answer to God for that and you have to answer to God for your vote. And we don't have to answer to each other. So we don't want to allow this issue, this fleshly strife, this contention, and this immaturity to enter into our church. We are allowed to disagree with one another. We have to do so respectfully and in love. And here's the thing. I believe the Holy Spirit showed me this regarding the upcoming election cycle. And there'll be one for local elections this coming month and then obviously a big election in 2020. But here's what the Lord showed me about 2020 that I think we need to focus on. Whether or not after November election of 2020, we end up with the same president for four more years or we have a new president for the next four years, one thing is certain. We will still have the same king. Jesus Christ will be our king, and that will not change. In Romans 14... Verse 13, Paul says, do not put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Why do I say that? Because once you've decided which candidate you think you want to support, then out of respect for other people who might not agree, it's probably not the best thing to be wearing the T-shirt that supports that candidate in the sanctuary or a campaign button. Let's just, you know, put the bumper sticker on your car, put the thing on your front lawn. You have every right to do those things. And you have a right to do it here. I'm saying, can we lay down that right for the sake of unity in the body and go forward together? Because I believe we are mature enough to do that. Hey, let's take this thing to a higher level. We're going to do a song here in closing. It's called Highest Ground. And in case uh, you start to recognize it, yes, it is Stevie Wonder. Get my guitar on, Paul. Thanks. Learning, souls 
just keep on burning. World, keep on turning, cause it won't be too long. Lying while people keep on dying, world keeps on turning, but it won't be for long. I'm so darn glad that I've been born again, cause the last time I looked, we're in a whole world of sin. I'm so glad that I knew more than I knew then Gonna keep on trying Till I reach my highest ground Teachers Keep on teaching Preachers Keep on preaching Words Keep on turning, cause it won't be too long. Cause the last time I looked we're in a whole world of sin I'm so glad that I know more than I do then Gonna keep on trying Till I reach my highest ground Till I reach my highest ground No one's gonna bring me down Till I reach my highest ground I'm gonna go higher Higher Let me hear you say higher Higher Take it out Hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you. You're calling us to the highest ground we can, we can function in, Lord. You're calling us to the highest place we can be. You're calling us out of immaturity into a place of true Christian maturity, servanthood, being able to respect one another, to have different opinions on things but not be in conflict about it to recognize that we're not always right about things and maybe listen to somebody else's viewpoint so we can grow together and go to the highest ground that you can take us to. We know that's your desire and that as we walk at the highest place you've called us to, you are most glorified. And we thank you and praise you for these things today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.